friendly and talkative. He was the kind of man who never used one word when ten would do. He described himself as someone who had a split personality. By day, he was a compassionate social worker, but by night, he would transform into the man the boxing world knew as. <laughs> Sylvester Mitty was born on October 29, 1956, in St. Lucia. His father was a hard-working disciplinarian, and Mitty stated that he learned to take beatings from his father. Arriving in Southampton from St. Lucia at the age of six, Mitty was one of eight children, all of them eventually living in the same flat in Bethnal Green. Bullied on the schoolyard, Mitty turned to boxing at the local boys club before going to the Crown and Manor gym where he began his amateur boxing career. In an interview on the Spittlefields Life blog, Mitty said, quote, Boxing was a shortcut. The demons that you have inside, they control you unless you can think in a philosophical way. Boxing becomes a microcosm of the world when you are exposed to the extreme highs and lows of this life. He would soon become an amateur star in Britain and would also charm reporters with his vocabulary and charisma. There is a popularly held misconception that the majority of boxers are monosyllabic buffoons, Mitty said. Despite his growing popularity, he was deemed by some to be too inexperienced when he was picked to represent Britain at the Olympics in Montreal in 1976. But Mitty's coach insisted that he was more advanced than John Stracy at similar stages in their careers. Mitty would enter the Olympics and be brave in a vain effort, losing to Romanian Simon Kutov in the tournament. Turning professional in October of 1977, Mitty would be guided by longtime British manager Terry Lawless. He would fight sporadically over the first three years of his career, winning 10 fights before suffering his first defeat against Des Morrison. Almost a year later, he would challenge Clinton McKenzie for the British super lightweight title. McKenzie and Mitty were good friends outside the ring and would engage in a tightly contested battle. champion in the second. As aggressive as he was earlier, and there's a little bit of frustration about Mitty at the moment. He doesn't look comfortable, and he doesn't look confident. And he looks even less confident now. Kenzie, not renowned as a big puncher, but he's hurting Mitty. And again taken full in the face this time. Went back on one foot. Absolutely jumped off his feet there by that punch. And Mackenzie now is threatening to win this very quickly. Mackenzie's still throwing him back. If some doubts are at last beginning to form in Mackenzie's mind whether he can really quell this suddenly aggressive challenger. Look at the way he pushed him back there. A strong man against the weak there with no, no doubt whatever. And he's turning the tide. By all that's miraculous, Mitty is turning the tide. Now he's ready to go for the title. Mitty really hurt that time by a punch to the head. Badly hurt at that. Right eye. And it's left a mark. Some sort of mark. And Mitty is again in trouble. No way he can survive now with one eye. Well, it 
slightly open now, the eye. And the pair of them now are punching each other to a standstill. is beginning to rise to them. People at the ringside beginning to get to their feet to clap and cheer them home. Marvellous sight. Utter appreciation of two fine fighters. What a great championship battle this has been. People all around the place now getting to their feet in these final few seconds. Everything now will depend on that referee, Mike Jacobs. It's in his hands now, and I've got them absolutely close. Could almost be a draw. There it is. But Mackenzie has got it. Mackenzie has got it. It must be by a very, very narrow margin indeed. But he... When I fought Clinton Mackenzie for the British title, Mitty said, I don't think I was psychologically prepared for the war that we had. Still, the fight was close, and Mitty drew rave reviews from the British press. But he grew frustrated at his inability to fight regularly while in Terry Lawless's stable. This inactivity, coupled with the fact that he broke his ankle in a motorcycle accident, caused Mitty to lose his enthusiasm for the sport. I've always been in boxing to make money, Mitty said. That's why it got frustrating when I didn't think I got enough fights. After 20 months out of the ring, Trainer Vic Andretti would convince Mitty that he still had a lot left. But the comeback didn't go well at first, as Mitty would lose his first fight back against Judas Clotty due to a cut eye. But he would regroup, stopping Clotty in a rematch, and then former junior welterweight champion Perico Fernandez. We're always there to be hit. Yeah. Joe Lewis said you can run but you can't hide. Very true. Time to G up Fernandez a bit. Uh, they're being a bit unfair actually to Mitty to do that because his, uh, his boxing almost well, he couldn't box much better really apart from landing the other guy up, and that's always easier said than done. Stop boxing, actually, that's it. Looks nice. He's going to object to that, though. He stopped it in the fifth. I don't, he's probably never been stopped like that before. He'll say, what was that all about? I always fight like that. Uh... Mitty would then take on the mysterious Fighting Romanus of Nigeria for the vacant Commonwealth welterweight title. Romanus threatened to unleash his Nigerian juju on Mitty, posing in a priest's robe and reading prophecies from the Bible during the build-up for the fight. Got Mitty ahead, okay. Started off a bit uh, testy, and we wondered what fighting Romanos from Nigeria was going to be like. He's a good boxer, but uh, hasn't been too good inside. Down a bit, yeah, picking away, and whenever, whenever he sees a chance, he'll start banging the big right hand. And... is a well-built middleweight, uh, welterweight, the Nigerian, and uh, he just caught a punch there and the foot went out the ring. If he gets caught with those, he should be arrested for loitering. In fact, he's cut the other way, and the crowd can sense that he's really got on top now, Mati, and he's uh, grabbing as hard as he can there, Romanos, to save himself. But he's a good finisher with a minute to go in this round, hooked it all over the place. And it looks as though Mitty can do it in the tenth. He's been waiting long enough with a stoppage, with six minutes of the contest to go. Oh, and that's one of the best shots he's thrown all the time. And it looks as though Nigeria, and he's looking to his corners. That's always the sort of semi-surrender signals, Jim, isn't it, when they do that? Yeah, that was a lovely right hand that landed there. 
And I don't think the manager's very much. That's what he's got to do. Stand his distance and pick the punches like that. And he stopped it, as I thought he might. In the 11th round. Just 40 seconds to go, we made it in the 11th. And it was always an inevitable win for Sylvester Middy, but he wanted to finish it in more or less championship style. His first championship win. And a very competent performance indeed by Mitty. Mitty impressed with the win. A reporter noted that under Terry Lawless, Mitty often seemed lethargic and lacking in concentration. Now under the promotional arm of Frank Warren, Mitty was born again aggressive. He called for a bout against Colin Jones, but the Welshman would retire after suffering a defeat to world champion Donald Curry. In May of 1985, Mitty would score one of his biggest wins to date as he floored former world title challenger Pedro Valela twice before earning a decision win. I could have done better, Mitty said after the victory, and I would have stepped it up if I needed to, but I'm a social worker, so I'm a bit lazy. On November 27, 1985, Mitty would defend his Commonwealth welterweight title against the up-and-coming Lloyd Hunnigan. These two fellows are really looking now for a shot at the worldweight championship of the world because it's the fight traders all say that Donald Curry and Milton McCrory, when they settle their argument, will give up the championship, and these fellows are in a shake-up. Sharper, a little bit more powerful at this stage. Yeah, he's just missed uh, Mitty's whisker a couple of times with nice-looking uppercuts. There he is. More of a stumble than a knockdown, but... Uh, oh, he won't like that, Mitty. He did interrupt you. He's going to give him the standing mandatory eight count, which is the European... Well, we've always known that uh, Lloyd Adelman's got a good punch variety. He brings him in from all angles. He's having a good round there. And, uh, well, uh, Silvette, as always say, can react to any given situation. And he's going to need to. But it's Halligan well on top. And Mitty, I don't think, has ever been floored as a professional. And I think I've seen nearly all his fights. And they're really screaming there in Hunnigan's corner. Mickey Dove, I can see, saying to Hunnigan, Fox, stick the left hand out, set the man up. Well, we're not going to be short of action here. And what a comeback this is by Mickey. Well under fire at the start. Sheer grip there, isn't it? Determination. What a good championship fight it's turned out to be. A rare triple championship to start, Jim. It's a question of imposing the will on when they're evenly skilled like this, really. Yeah, but this isn't the, the typical classic performance from Mitty. He's running into trouble again. He's making too many mistakes. Mitty's cut, Red. Mitty's cut over the right eye. So he's cut over the eye. He's really in the wars there, isn't he? Teeth are now cut over the right eye. There's some kind of clash in there. You see him blinking and pulling away, Mitty. He's leaking again already. Got it. It's in a difficult position. Yes, he's, he's got to give him another standing eight count. And this time, Mitty doesn't appear to be protesting in round six. And that definitely is the first time I've seen him on the floor as a pro. If we ignore the first one. And I tell you, the referee's having a, a long and hard look there. Mitty hardly taking his eyes off him as he, can, he knows which is the man in trouble. A little bit, a little bit of acting there, Jim, wasn't it, by Hannigan? Yeah, a lot of showmanship there. Lloyd's kind of famous for that, yeah. I think I think the difference now is that Lloyd's enjoying the work. Uh, Sylvester knows it's an uphill struggle all the way, and I don't really think he can expect it to get much better. The, the, the only hope for victory now, I suppose, is uh, if Hannigan starts running out of steam. But the problem really here, the, the doctor now is being called. They do this in the European rules. I've got to Adrian White, Whiteson, uh, the specialist, actually, the, the boxing doctor, as we call him, is, is having a good look. And it's 
It's all over in the eighth round. And it's obviously deeper than it looked for the Nuss uh, outside the ring thought it was. And uh, really, they did a good job keeping him going that long. And promoter Warren there commiserating with Mitty. Despite the loss, Mitty would remain busy over the next year and have a chance meeting outside a gas station with fellow British contender Kirkland Lang. Lang's car had run out of gas and he didn't have any money on him. Lang then asked to borrow a few quid from Mitty and Sylvester replied, don't bother Kirkland, you're a has-been, refusing to give Lang the handout. Lang became angry, telling Mitty, fate will make me meet you in the ring. Lang's words became prophetic as the two would meet on March 14, 1987 for the vacant British welterweight title. Well, it's probably, the, uh, let's face it, the end of the road in title terms for a loser here. Oh, there we go. Uh, a little early here, or late. Referee there. Oh, oh, the punch on the deck. Now, that's going to be a difficult one. I've just congratulated him early on for not doing that, and now he's done it. Oh, he did well to get away from that, Max. Mitty was just standing off waiting for him to make one more mistake and he'd have nailed him with that. We normally expect his best work to come early. <laughs> oh, that was a good right hand over the top there and he flinched there, Mitty. As though I think he caught his head as well, Jim, after he'd hit him with the right hand. In the fourth round, with a minute gone in the fourth. Lang came in there, he's timing that well, Lang. Caught him warning on the back of the neck with that one. I'm not sure I agree with the referee there, Jim. Well, I think Mickey ducked underneath the punch, landed there behind his neck. But yeah, exactly. I don't, think, I don't think it was intentional. But oh, that was a perfect shot. I don't know. It's all right hand happy, but it's paying off now as Lang has got Mitty trapped in uh, Lang's corner almost. And now he's been able to move away. He was going to take up a count there. No, he stopped it. He stopped it. And that did surprise me there in a championship fight. I never criticise referees to stop in contest quickly, but what do you think, Jim? Well, Thanks very much, Dickie. It's not always that the loser comes over so quickly. Suvi, what was your view on how that fight finished? Well, I was doing very well in the fight, and what happened, the last shot, Kirkman threw a right-hander and the thumb was sticking out. And the thumb went into my eye, and it totally messed up my perspective. And after I got that thumb in the eye, it also upset my balancing because I can't focus out of that eye. And literally, when he hit me in the eye, it was almost like, well, the only thing I could um, describe it, it felt like the eye was pushed to the back of the head. And it just, as I say, just messed up my balance mechanism. But after the way you started, were you a bit disappointed at the way he got to you and obviously hurt you? Yeah, but he, he, it, Kirkman was getting tired. I know that, and it was, uh, basically, it was the last, I think Kirkman, was, it was the last dish effort. I mean, had I weathered that, had I not got a thumb, I was still strong enough to take over Kirk in the later stages. Listen, it's tough to ask you this while you're still sweating and obviously very disappointed, but people will ask now, well, what is there left for Sylvester Mitty? Yeah, um, I, I also ask the same thing as well, but I'm terribly disappointed now, and I don't think it now is the right time I could come out with an objective opinion. So I'm going to look at the fight, see how I was performing, and within the next couple of months, I'll make up my mind what I'm going to do. But at this moment, I'm terribly disappointed because I know I had a beat in the Kirk had I not... And it, it was a good punch. But the most damaging thing was the thumb got me in the eye. Listen, I appreciate you coming over. The loss to Lang would be Mitty's last moment in the spotlight. He would fight once more a year later and was scheduled to face the comebacking Terry Marsh in 1989, but the former junior welterweight champion pulled out. Mitty would never return to the ring. He would continue on as a community worker and in his spare time perform poetry readings at an East London pub theatre where he has become known as the Sage of Bethnal Green.